Good evening, and welcome to the Christian Truckers Network. This is a ministry that welcomes guest speakers to share their testimonies as well as the Word of God as the Holy Spirit leads. If you would like to be a participant, you can call in at 641-715-0689. Then they'll ask for an access code, and that is 863-397, and then the pound sign. Again, that number is 641-715-0689, and the access code is 863-397, and then the pound sign. Well, good evening, and we'd like to welcome each and every one of you. Here we are, another Thursday. I love Thursdays. A lot of people have different days of the week they look forward to for different reasons, being halfway through the week or, you know, the beginning of the weekend, but I enjoy my Thursdays. And that's because I get to have my friends as well as mighty men of God to come on the the trucker, the Christian Truckers Network, to share the testimonies, to share what the Lord has laid on their hearts, uh, to teach to us, to preach to us, whatever the Lord has led them. And, and it takes, uh, it's my honor to introduce uh, my friend and a very mighty man of God, uh, Sam McGinn. Uh, he uh, oversees Samaritan's Purse and, uh, again, a mighty man of God. So, uh, Brother Sam, uh, it's all in under your control. Well, thank you, Brother Stephen. I'm glad to be a part of this, and I welcome all of you who might be listening. And just want to hit some key points and some of the issues of life that all of us deal with, and that all of us in some way are uh, connected with. And we uh, want to look at the theme of the powerful hope of Christ for a broken world. I actually serve as senior staff chaplain for Samaritan's Purse at headquarters based in Boone, North Carolina. And I love my work, and there's a lot of it. I love the people I work with. And I love these kinds of opportunities just to talk about real life. Just by way of introduction, I uh, crossed over 40 years in pastoral ministry this past summer, and part of that time I was a full-time pastor. Part of it I was a bivocational pastor. I have an electrical background, and I've been with Samaritan's Purse for almost 19 years full-time, but started on special projects a little over 20 years ago. And there's always something happening, whether it's local or around the world. And that's kind of where all of us are. Uh, All of you and where you might be traveling is crisscrossing the United States and different parts of the country, northeast, south, and west, uh, from uh, little places and uh, small towns to the big cities. And wherever you go, you're going to meet people that have the same kinds of needs that you do. They don't always voice them. And then sometimes they don't know how to talk about it because there's so many issues. And I want to begin with a verse in uh, Psalm chapter 4. And it it says here, it's very interesting, Psalm 4, verse 6, there are many who say, who will show us any good? Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. Have you heard that said in so many words, even today maybe? There's so many people that are disillusioned and they're cynical. They feel like they've been betrayed. They feel like, well, nobody really understands me, and if they do, they don't care. And so as advanced as our society is and advanced as our country is, even globally, as we hear a lot today, with all of the electronic connections, people are still not connected. You know, there's a difference between hearing and listening. And so sometimes people hear other people, but they're not listening In the same way, spiritually, we might hear a sermon, we might hear a good Bible teaching, 
we might be in a special service. But suddenly we realize we're hearing out there, we're hearing some rumblings, but we're really not listening. But it's so interesting when we look at uh, our Lord Jesus Christ. We can see him in many different ways. First of all, he's the Lord of glory. He's not just the Son of God. He's God the Son, the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so we see him, though, and it's amazing to think about it. The eternal Son of God stepped out of eternity into time in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and walked on the same earth, having the same kinds of experiences that you and I have, living in a real world, being brought up in, in a very simple home and possibly a very, very low-income home. And the way you learn that is because when Joseph and Mary brought sacrifices to the temple, they brought in the two turtle doves. That was kind of the least type of sacrifice that they could make. They couldn't afford something more than that, which is very interesting. So the Lord Jesus himself, submitting to the will of the Father, grew up in a real town in real time and it says that he was a carpenter's son. Joseph was a master carpenter. And it says all throughout the Gospels of how Jesus was a carpenter's son. And so he's defined as an apprentice. And then later in the Gospels, you see where he is a master carpenter himself. And just like the different stages in all of the professions, even in trucking, but being familiar with electrical, you start out as being a helper and then maybe a mechanic and then a journeyman and then a master electrician, meaning that you've learned more and more as you go along. And we all should know more now than we knew when we were younger or when we first started because God created us to grow. But an interesting thing, think about it. Jesus was the son of a carpenter who himself became a master carpenter while here on the earth, but he was also the creator of the universe. All things were made by him and through him and for him, as we learn in Colossians. The Lord of glory, who yet took on human flesh and became a carpenter, of all the professions for him to hold as the creator of the universe. These are just kinds of things that are interesting. And it, it's amazing that God chose to step out of eternity into this world. Why? because of, as Max Lucado has said, because of what is said in the numbers of hope, he says, which are John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. How is it? that God did what he did because he so loved the world. It could have read, for God was so annoyed with or troubled by or filled with rage about this world that he decided to throw it like a fastball straight into hell. But we don't see that in John 3.16. God stepped out of eternity, took on human flesh, came into this world, 
because he loved it. And loved it enough that he healed the sick, restored blind eyes, and muted speech, and deaf ears, even raised the dead. But more than that, he went all the way to the cross that we might be forgiven and that we might have hope, confirming that hope with the resurrection, which was life-changing and still is. So the cross was a part of that. Again, going back to where we started, Lord, there are many who say, who will show us any good? Lord, lift up the, the light of your countenance upon us. And the greatest light that could have ever come is the light of our Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, we see that from the very beginning. We see him saying and hear him saying as we read the word, I'm the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in the darkness, but shall have the light of life. In Psalm 119, verse 130, you know, that's a really long psalm. But chapter 119, verse 130 says, The entrance of thy words giveth light. So wherever the Lord Jesus Christ goes and where the gospel of Jesus Christ goes, whether it's in and among your friends or your communities or around the world, wherever the gospel travels, and gospel means good news, hope inevitably follows. It always follows. And history shows that. Sometimes in the world we see political philosophies that go bad. We hear of dictators and tyrants. And that's talked about in the origins of our nation, how we were seeing people that would come to a place where they could call home and it would be ruled by government that was not oppressive, but was following in the tradition, actually, of the gospel. And sometimes that's downplayed, but there was so much intentional Christian leadership in the founding of the country. When we go back and we see that, yes, wherever the gospel goes, hope always follows. I had to be up at Presbyterian Hospital in Charlotte, North Carolina, actually where I was born back over 67 years ago. And I had to visit with my brother as an emergency uh, that he was going through. He's a year and a half younger. I'm the oldest of three. It just shows you the kind of things that break in this broken world. And this time it was so tiny you could barely see it. He went in for a simple procedure. They finally had located the problem with numbness in his legs and in his foot. He's a pretty active guy. He's 65, but he's still active and a very gifted man. He's a very wonderful husband and father, too. But um, he was having a hard time walking, and they found this tiny blood clot behind his knee and so it called for surgery vascular surgery to remove the clot but then things went wrong my sister-in-law called me and I knew I had to take off for Charlotte I left the house at 6.30 in the morning about a two hour drive and it looked pretty serious because while they were trying to break this clot, the instrument being pushed into the vessel 
came apart in the bloodstream. As though a clot was bad enough, the instrument to dissolve the clot fell apart. And so there he was. And he was semi-conscious. He wasn't totally sedated because it was just going to be an outpatient procedure. They had to call a manufacturer's rep, and I don't know how they did it, but they got him to the hospital. But what was going to be about a two-hour surgery lasted over five hours because the manufacturer's rep had to guide the surgeon in how to retrieve all of the pieces that had fallen into the bloodstream because an instrument broke apart. So here's some observations. It's a broken world. Even with the greatest technology we have, and you know that's how we're communicating tonight, by technology. It can be used for the glory of God and for the benefit of humanity. And I think back on that hospital because I walked that same day. I took a photograph of it. The original cornerstone is now in a separate monument because they built onto that building many times. But that cornerstone has inscribed on it, dedicated to the glory of God in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's some other words, and it has the date 1907. And that's just an example of how wherever the gospel goes, hope always follows. Gospel goes, people hear the truth of Christ and their lives are transformed, their homes are transformed, their communities are transformed. Or they build clinics, they build hospitals, they do good things. Not as something to merit salvation because that's a free gift of God's grace. We could never earn it. We could never pay for it. We could never buy it. We don't get special treatment. It's not a matter of status. It's not a matter of your name. It's not a matter of your skin color. It's not a matter of your heritage. It's the grace of God for those who believe. But wherever the gospel goes, hope always follows. And by the way, my brother came through that surgery just fine. But since he was semi-conscious, he knew something had gone wrong, so his blood pressure skyrocketed. And they gave him a blood pressure medicine, and he had never had any before. The medicine that they gave him caused him to have to go into coronary care. And they were afraid he then was going to have a stroke. But thankfully, things calmed down. And uh, I could talk a lot about those kinds of things that happen. But all of us have our stories, don't we, where something just went wrong. And you really can't explain it sometimes. Sometimes you can't explain it. Somebody's goofed up. Somebody failed. Somebody made an innocent mistake, but it was very costly. In a variety of ways. And then there are those who said, what? what's life worth? And people are asking those questions today. So it doesn't matter how much they have. It doesn't matter how great their job is. It doesn't matter how many accomplishments they've attained. It does not matter how much education they have formal or informal, it doesn't matter. They're just looking for hope because all these things can be useful, but they don't fulfill the desires of the heart. So people are saying in so many ways, who will show us any good? And then that prayer comes, Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. What is that light? That light is the glory of God and our Lord Jesus Christ, who again, as he said, I'm the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And then if we want to go over to Romans chapter 13 at verse 12, there's some interesting words contrasting light and darkness. It says, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. So we have that contrast. And it's a lifelong contrast. All of us who experienced it or seen it or have been affected by it in some way or another, 
there's some kind of situation we find ourselves in that's going to follow the light or it's going to go down the trail of darkness, or we're going to be caught in the middle of something between the light and the darkness, and we wonder which way to go, always go toward Jesus. But, but Paul really prevails upon the Romans, and he says, therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. And let us put on the armor of light. Now you see how those two go together? They're inseparable. Sometimes people are really trying, sincerely trying, with all they can muster within themselves to cast off the works of darkness, those things that are troubling them. And there are multitudes of problems and issues. We know that. We could sit here and name all of those, and we'd be up the rest of the night. We have other things to do, don't we? It says, cast off the the works of darkness, but sometimes they miss that immediate next phrase, and let us put on the armor of light, which is the gospel, which is the hope of Christ, the person of Christ, our Savior, our Shepherd, our Redeemer, the Lord of glory who gives us his armor of light. So before we can cast off the works of darkness, and before we can defeat those foes, those of spiritual darkness that are lurking about and encroaching upon us, uh, we've got to embrace the light, the light of Christ, who he is, who says, come to me, All you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find a rest for your souls. And that's what so many people are looking for, rest for their souls. And they're weary. They can't find rest because they keep looking. They haven't found it in the person of Christ. There's an interesting contrast also between the light and darkness. And, of course, there's a, a visible part of, about that. We think about, like, at night it's dark, and in the daytime it's bright, generally. We have a lot of clouds up here in the mountains of North Carolina sometimes. But the major difference is that the light, whether it says God created in the universe and the solar system, particularly the sun, 93 million miles away to round it off. And yet, if we were any further away from the sun, the earth would would freeze over. If we were any closer, we would perish because it would be burned up. And just that right balance God has, has given us. And so you know how it feels when you've been through some gray day weather and snow and sleet and ice and fog. And uh, you know what it feels like, don't you, when the sun breaks through. You feel it as well as see it. You feel the warmth of the sun. But darkness is different. It is different because it's like givers and takers. The sun is like a giver. The darkness is like a taker. That's how it is in the spiritual realm. Of course, we want to sleep at night where it's reasonably dark and God created us to sleep. Isn't that amazing? That's part of the way we've been designed. We need light. We need that rest. We need that kind of darkness. Is a different matter. But when you look at the light, the life that the light gives, it's, it's visible. It, it's amazing. One of my daughters is an organic farmer and gardener, very talented in that. 
one works in Washington, D.C., and I have a son who's a designer, and they have three children. So I have three grandchildren, and they're all different. One thing we know we like to do is go somewhere where there's a lot of light. You do too. We're all the same in so many respects. We don't take a a vacation when we have that opportunity to. We don't go somewhere usually to a cave. (laughs) People do explore caves, of course. And there are the caverns in Linville, North Carolina, not far from here, that are amazing. And how deep they go into the earth. That's not really a normal vacation spot. People like to go where there's a lot of sun, even if it's a ski slope with sunlight. But they don't gravitate toward the darkness. Like Paul said, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Now here's the the major contrast. The darkness, when it speaks of spiritual darkness, is like a vortex. It's like it's swirling and swirling and swirling like a whirlpool pulling us down. It's like an undertow on the seacoast pulling us down. And darkness is like that, pulling us into a situation where we don't belong. We didn't think, we didn't start out that day telling ourselves and everybody else, I'm going to be pulled into this situation today and I'm going to enjoy it. We don't think that way because we know it's not right. But see, the darkness pulls us in whereas the light brings us out. It's like the sunlight that helps a seed to germinate and grow vegetables and flowers, whatever you're growing. Light brings life. So again, repeating that, the night is far spent, Paul writes, the day is at hand. Let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Then we say, yes, we want to do that and we need to do that. But it's so important for us to realize We can do that when we've given our hearts to Christ, when we've asked him for help and for strength and for wisdom. And not just those different qualities we would ask for and that we would want in our lives. Far more than that is to say, Lord Jesus, I want you, and I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want you to use me for your glory and I want to stay close to your heart. I want to be your servant. I don't know what that looks like but I want to be your servant because if I'm your servant I'm going to be going the right direction but I can't do it in my own strength. I'm helpless. Even Paul had written to the Romans earlier said while we were yet without strength uh, While we were yet helpless, Christ died for the ungodly and for those those sinners that we all are. He gave his life for us. And so it's with his strength we can cast off the workness, the works of darkness, and we can embrace the light. We can cast it off. We can turn away from it, not in our strength, but in God's strength as he enables us and as he strengthens us. You know, we we still find ourselves thinking, well, if I work hard enough and long enough, then I'm going to find God's favor. But that's not true. But that's where I was even uh, growing up hardly ever missing church. I tell you, it it was incredible how we did. And we really didn't know the Lord Jesus Christ, Uh, not my mom or dad or or my brothers. 
you know, but we were going to church because it was a good thing to do. You know what? It had value. I know God used it in my life, but I didn't know who Jesus really was. I did not understand the gospel. When I began to understand the gospel, then I could see how everything fits together when I understood that that's good news, which is what the gospel, what the word gospel means. Good news. Good news. It takes us out of out of the darkness and brings us into light. And we all have different kinds of experiences in that. But I remember trying so hard. You know, I really wanted to be a, a good boy. I wanted to behave myself. I wanted to do good things for people. And I was thinking to myself, you know, I think this is what God wants me to do. Well, yes, it could be, but that's not what saves us. It's not what we do. It's not the works of righteousness we do, as Paul writes. But it's his grace. For by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. I had no idea what that verse meant, and I'm sure I had read it, but I did not know what it meant. By grace are you saved through faith. Because I remember when my grandmother was uh, widowed on my father's side of the family, and my granddad was one of my favorite people who taught me so much and always had time for me and introduced me to electricity. He started the business in 1916, and he only had a sixth grade education. He's one of the smartest men I've ever known. And I was so stricken when he passed away. And I was so thankful you know, that he did belong to the Lord. But I thought, I'm going to help my grandmother every way I can. And I had begun working on cars when I was 13 years old. We had a Willis CJ2, a, uh, a 1947, that had a four-cylinder flathead engine. And then later we had a 1960 CJ3B Willis Jeep that had the first overhead valve engine. That's why they had to make those hoods taller, because the engine was so tall. That's why they went to that higher uh, frame. All that aside, I remember learning, and my grandfather had taught me a lot about replacing the fuel pump, replacing the plugs and points. Back then, they wouldn't last 8,000 miles. They burned up, had to be replaced. Voltage regulators, generators, before they had alternators. It seems like everything broke and everything had to be replaced. And that was unfortunately kind of a legacy of a lot of those old Jeeps. And I learned a lot that way, and I was thinking, I'm going to take care of my grandmother's old Ford. She had a 54 Ford two-door, three on the column, as they say, three on the tree, a 223 cubic inch six-cylinder engine. And it was a steady engine, noisy engine, but it was pretty steady. And I remember putting a new carburetor on that engine, thinking, you know, I think this is something that kind of will help me. Helping my grandmother is a good thing. Of course it's a good thing. But I was also thinking, you know, this is one more point I can make. Uh, you know, hope I make it. hope I have enough points that I can get into heaven by being good. And then yet I was failing, falling short of the glory of God young man struggling with stuff. And then then I came to know the living Christ. And I realized that he gave that invitation that no one else has ever been able to give. And that invitation is found in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and following. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, 
for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. A lot of you, especially those of you who are driving and on the road traveling, you're carrying heavy loads of all kinds. I appreciate some friends that I met through Steve Richardson that on uh, one of your programs uh, out of Palmetto State Transportation, Greenville, South Carolina, that sent uh, shipments of uh, water to the work of Samaritan's Purse down in in Texas after the terrible hurricanes and the floods, along with uh, some dry goods as well and another load. But I remember on board that truck was a total of 44,000 pounds of bottled water. And all of you are, are familiar with carrying loads. Right now you're heavy laden and you're going down the road. I don't know what you're driving, what kind of road tractor it is, but a lot of different ones out there. I'm really surprised to see the automatic transmission once once in a while. I drove a school bus for years, and my first school bus was a 1954 Chevrolet four-speed stove bolt six-cylinder engine. And when I was serving as a pastor, I could I kept my license up. My, I got to drive a brand new Chevrolet, and it was so tight, and it had a five-speed with a V8. All that aside, we know what it is to carry a heavy load. And Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I'm gentle and lowly in heart. In other words, he's safe. He's not going to take advantage of us. He's not going to do anything but to breathe life and hope into our our hearts and souls when we come to him and say, Lord Jesus, just come into my life. Forgive my sins. Cleanse my heart. And use me to your glory. We humans can get awfully preoccupied and complicated. We'll take the simple message of the gospel and complicate it so badly that we don't understand it, or we keep others from understanding it. Interesting, isn't it, that uh, Jesus used as an example of true faith a little child. In the account in Mark, and there's several accounts with Jesus, where there was a little boy that gave the fish and the loaves that Jesus multiplied, which was amazing. But when And Mark says he took them up in his arms and blessed them. And he said, unless you become as little children, humble yourselves as little children, you'll not enter the kingdom of heaven. And he said, you've got to be converted, which means a heart has to be transformed. We can't transform our hearts. Only God can do that. And it's in the same way as Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, you're carrying a heavy load, a load of uh, baggage, past, bad memories, bad experiences, sorrows, regrets, disappointments, or you feel betrayed, or you feel alone, or you feel rejected. And, you know, there's, there's all kind of loads out there that people are carrying, all kinds of baggage, and it just weighs us down. Jesus says, come to me with that stuff in so many words. I'm not going to make life easy for you or wealthy or prosperous, except in spiritual things. We'll find great treasure in the Word of God. We'll find that we can mine those treasures and never run out of something to learn and something to receive. Most of all, the treasure who he is. And it says in Colossians, 
is Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Treasures don't become a burden or heavy loading unless they're misused. The treasures that God is speaking about here are, are life-giving and life-imparting, and they come from him. I could just talk and talk and talk, and I wish we were in a forum where we could uh, ask questions, but there's so many people today that are just broken down and they just feel overwhelmed. Through a good friend I have, and I heard that some of these connections are up in Canada. I have a good friend in the province of Alberta, Canada. And he called a couple nights ago, and he was talking about a lady from Arizona that has had a wonderful ministry that just is a personal kind of one-on-one ministry, uh, mostly in her case, working with women and helping women who've been through difficult situations. And her theme is, because she's had enough, she's had so many disasters in her own life, but her theme is the least, the lost, and the nearly dead. You ever known anybody like that or even felt that way yourself? The least, the lost, and the nearly dead. Those are the people that God has placed on her heart. And I thought that's a great theme for all of us. You know, Jesus never forgot the least. Oh, my, look at how he defined uh, true generosity with the widow giving her mites at the temple there. The little mites. Others were sounding the the trumpets. Well, in some case, that was actually a trumpet, but it also could refer to those big coffers that they could throw um, down into and, and make a lot of noise with all of those coins rattling in there. But uh, whichever way you're going to look at it, it's uh, it's very interesting that he never forgot the least of those who were among us. And it's amazing that the Apostle Paul, who was actually uh, quite a scholar himself and a man uh, very famous, uh, he, uh, he called himself by a certain phrase, said, I'm the chief of sinners. I'm not just a sinner, he said. I'm the chief of sinners because he knew what God brought him out of. He had no intention of becoming a follower of Christ. And there on the road to Damascus, transformation took place like never before. Like he had never imagined. Life was never the same after that. And he knew what God had delivered him from, what kind of mire that the Lord Jesus Christ had pulled him out of, and how he had transformed his life. You know, all of us have uh, different teachers and preachers who've influenced us all around the country, in some cases around the world who've been faithful in teaching the Word of God and preaching the Word of God. A well-known and famous preacher back in the 19th century was Charles Haddon Spurgeon. He was an amazing communicator. He uh, got a lot of opposition, interestingly enough, from a very uh, kind of uh, legalistic uh, very, uh, well, sophisticated type of uh, church setting because he he chose to speak to people not in formalities but with the living word of Christ because that was life-changing and just a gifted communicator. And God greatly used him. In fact, um, people thronged there by the thousands. And he was persecuted. He was uh, looked down on to say he doesn't fit in this setting. And yet, 
on October the 7th, 1857, he preached to 23,654 people at London's Crystal Palace. You can look that up and read about it. It's an amazing building built back then during the time of Queen Victoria. And he felt rather overwhelmed even before the event started. He went in that massive building and just realized that God had placed him there and he felt totally overwhelmed because he knew he couldn't preach anything apart from the grace of God and the power of his spirit. So on the day before, he visited that, uh, they call it the hall there, the Crystal Palace. You see, this was a big exposition place, by the way. It wasn't a church, church building, so-called. But it was the biggest place they had. And he was just not sure if his voice would carry. So he decided to rehearse it a little bit. And so there in a largely empty building, he thundered out 1 Timothy 1.15. And he said it as though he was preaching it. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. That's how he rehearsed his voice, that one verse. But what he did not know was happening at that same moment. There was a workman who worked in that palace, that crystal palace it was called, and he was was distraught and depressed. And he didn't know what to do but go into that area, it's kind of like a Capitol Dome in Washington, D.C., and has those statues around. They had statues in there and everything. He was down there praying. He just didn't even know how to pray. He was so troubled. And then Spurgeon, had, at the same time, thundered out that text from First Timothy 1, 15. And this man could not believe what had happened. It was exactly what he needed to hear that God in his mercy forgives sinners, and he gave his heart to Christ as a result. And so there it is, you know, the hope of the gospel. And then people say, I don't want to hear all this sin talk. Well, of course, that can be hard. But see, it's it's, it's reality, it's fact of life. We don't even have to define it. We see it somehow or another every day. But what matters, you know, right now is that we have a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave his his life for us, poured out his own precious blood at Calvary's cross to pay our debt, to sin debt, provide atonement, provide forgiveness of sins, that we might have hope, might live to his glory. and that we might give our hearts to him because he hasn't changed. Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. And in Romans 8, where Paul says, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us, for I'm persuaded that Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's our hope. I guess as I wrap things up here, I I know uh, I wanted, if you have any questions, uh, would like, uh, you would like uh, a Bible or a New Testament or a copy of uh, Franklin Graham's book, Rebel with a Cause, or a book, The Name, that was written about the name of Jesus. 
you want to know more about the Christian life, there are no strings attached on this. You're not going to receive a telephone call asking for a donation. We'd like to provide those for you. You can contact me. You'd have to put my name on it so we'll know how to where it's coming from with your name and address. And uh, you can send it to me, Sam McGinn, M-C-G-I-N-N, at Samaritan's Purse, P.O. Box 3000, Boone, N.C., 28607. If you can't remember that, and of course can't write it down because you're driving, just remember Samaritan's Purse, all one word, dot org, S-A-M-A-R-I-T-A-N-S, P-U-R-S-E, no apostrophe, SamaritansPurse.org. And then you can look up uh, how you can know, come to know Christ. It has a whole section on that. Or you can type in PeaceWithGod.net. That's a wonderful website that explains the gospel provided by the Billy Graham Association. And you know, he's in his 100th year. He turned 99 back in November. So keep him in prayer. He's still, his biggest ministry is praying for people. Thank you for your prayers, too. Thank you for your interest in God's kingdom. And thank you, Brother Steve, for this invitation. It's been a, a joy to be with you. I wish I could see you face to face. Uh, but um, maybe we'll meet someday. And I have a little hound dog out there, but she hadn't stirred a bit. I thought she might bark into the radio <laughs> tonight, but that didn't happen. Anyway, God bless all of you. If you have any uh, questions uh, about this, you'll just want it privately. Look up peacewithgod.net, and they'll guide you through that. That's an Internet evangelism program. God bless all of you. And may you know and experience the powerful hope of Christ in this broken world where so many people are asking, who will show us any good? It's already been shown to us when God stepped out of eternity and into time in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. He showed it to us. David said, Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. He did. Jesus came as the light of the world. People are still asking that question, though, aren't they? We want to be able to give an account of that hope within us, as Peter said. So, uh, again, God bless you. God bless you as you travel and all that you do and your friends and your families and your customers and your coworkers, fellow truckers, all around, crisscrossing the country. God bless you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Have a good evening. Wherever you are, whatever time zone you're in, I'm in Eastern, wherever you are, God bless you, all of you. Amen. Amen. Well, Brother Sam, I know I have a couple comments I'd like to make. Uh, if you've got time, we need to take a short break, and we'll come right back and uh, open up for any kind of questions or comments. Those that have called in by the round table, uh, it'll just be uh, uh, about a minute of just quiet. Uh, so we'll sure. be right back. We would like to invite you to tune in to Smokehouse Studios Front Porch Show. We are live Saturday evenings at 6 p.m. Central Time. We discuss current events and Bible prophecy and how it all relates into the days that we find ourselves in today. You can find Smokehouse Studios Front Porch Show by searching for it on iHeartRadio, TuneIn Radio, and Spreaker Radio. We also invite you to tune in to our website at smokehousestudios.net. There you can click the radio show link, and on the radio show page, there is a player there to hear our shows as well. They do podcasts, so you can go back into the archives and listen to our past shows. Tune in Saturday evenings at 6 p.m. Central Time. Amen, amen. Well, Brother Sam, there was a couple things that you had mentioned. You know, every time somebody comes to um, comes to speak to us, there's always something that jumps out and grabs me. 
and in listening to you this evening, there was a, there's quite a few things that come out and grab me. But the one thing that uh, I was thinking about when you was talking about, you know, that that simple little procedure that your brother was having, just a simple little procedure, and mm-hmm. how it blew up into a major thing, and 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 it could have been and and was very life threatening had one of them particles of that tool had gotten into his heart and uh, you know made it up oh, that yes. way. It, it could have been it could have been devastating. And you know when I was when I was listening to you talk about that, you know it, it reminded me of sin. You know it's just a, a little thing. Just a little thing. You think, you know, this is this is no big deal. You know, it's just it's just a little thing, but it grows and it grows until before you realize it, it has totally consumed you, and now you end yeah. up with that uh, feeling of separation from God. You know how one little small thing, whether it be uh, uh, a little bit of flirtation with a secretary or something like that, and the next thing you know, it's uh, grown into a full-blown adulterous affair, or whether it be you know just uh, you know this little pop-up come up on my computer, and uh, you know I'm going to click on it and see what what it's all about. You know, it's just I'm just going to take a a quick little peek, and the next thing you know, you're fighting an addiction to pornography. Yeah, and, you know that's, that's what right. that's what I was thinking about when you was talking about that. It seems so small and so simple. That vortex. Yeah. Yes, yes, could just blow yeah. up into a major thing. And the other thing yeah. that really uh, caught me was, you know, you know, we live in a time frame. You know, uh, the Lord knows uh, every second of our life, of course, but we, we live in this, when you compare it to an eternity, it's just a very small amount of time where God yeah. Yeah. has no time. <laughs> you know, that's what really amazed me when you said that. That's right, God right. has no time. He lives. Uh, it's like there's, you know, I visualize a, a long line uh, with a dot somewhere in that line. And that line yeah, is our that. time yeah. frame. Yeah, and that dot, you know, of course, being us. But God stands on the outside of that and looks into yeah. that. That, that, that just really amazed me. You know, I mean, we've heard different things like that, you know, that make you think about that. But, but when you had said that tonight about, you know, he, he left an eternity and he came into our time. And our time became very minute. That, that really, uh, you know, that really uh, impressed my mind. Uh, you know, it got me thinking in many directions. Well, it, I, I think we're all intrigued by that some way or another. You know, it's just like even the smallest cell of the human body and blood cell is like its own little universe. How in the world is it? God Amen. created it so so amazingly. Amen. Amen. We, we miss well, things. Know, right, right. And, and with that being said, you know, and, and, and going back to, um, you know, that, that just that little small, uh, thing that we get involved in, you know. I know, I know the Lord brings people. He draws people. Even Jesus says, "I have all those that the Lord that that the Father has drawn unto me." And I know that uh, those that come, uh, you know, by radio, or those that come uh, through the Lord's round table, they're drawn. You know, I believe the Lord draws mm-hmm. them to that. And and what you had to, what you talked about tonight was speaking to their heart. And mm. in that illustration, uh, with the very small of that, if there's somebody out here, uh, Brother Sam, that is struggling with that small little thing that has grown, what would mm. be your recommendations for them? Well, the first step is to uh, really face it. And sometimes... Emotionally, it becomes a lot bigger than it really is. But left unattended, it doesn't get better on its own. It begins to spiral out of control. The first thing is to see it for what it is to face it and then to realize, I need help. I need help out of this. I need to be rescued out of this. And... uh Sometimes uh, it's by the grace of God and your own personal experience when he begins to bring healing in your life and your heart. 
it's just maybe between you and him or it might be in a relationship with uh, husband and wife or brother or sister or two brothers or two sisters or a co-worker and then you share these things and they say you know I've had that same struggle and, and to pray for one another like the Bible says pray for one another and so that you're healed, meaning like a healing of emotions. There are a lot of people, it doesn't matter how big they are, how strong they are, what their job title is, um, have a way of feeling, wow, this is so much bigger than me, and I need help. Um, When people ask for help, it's when you're helped, if you... uh, It's no shame to admit that when you need to ask for help. That's not weakness. That's that's being smart. That's being strong. Saying I need help. I can't get this. I can't get out of this by myself. Only God can help me. And it will be little by little. Uh, It's pretty interesting. God works with us uh, in different ways with all of us. With the same goal is to know Christ. But some, uh, he brings people into your life. He brings a Bible verse into your heart, uh, something that you heard a preacher share or Bible teacher. A lot of ways we learn. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, you know, that, that brings another question to my mind. Um, you know, when when a person gets into a situation that they can't deal with and they know they need help, you know, we, we've heard the stories, uh, you know, we've heard testimonies from people that, you know, I, I cried out to God and, and he didn't help me. You know, I asked the Lord to to get me through this and I didn't hear nothing from him. You know, mm-hmm. I, the scripture that comes to my mind in uh, Mark, I think it's Mark nine thirty one, it says that God only hears the voice of those he knows. You know, so these so when someone get in distress like that, if they haven't truly uh, committed their lives to Jesus Christ, you know, if you were talking to that person right mm-hmm. now, what would you say to them? Well, um, you know, when you, uh, like in Psalm, Psalm 51 is a, is a good psalm to read where uh, David confesses his sin, and he's crying out to God. But it says there, a broken and contrite heart, thou wilt not despise, O God. So when somebody comes to the Lord, and they don't even have the right words to say or don't know what to say, they come with a broken heart that says, Lord, I just need your healing. I need your grace and your mercy. Uh, even Paul talks about that in Romans 8, and where he says, I think around verse 26, uh, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, even with groans. That's kind of an interesting scripture there. We don't know how to pray as we ought. But all we could do maybe is groan. God translates that. He understands it. <clears throat> because he understands the cries of our heart. And broken and contrite heart, he won't despise, he won't turn away, he won't push away. Pretty interesting. Oh my, he could have long ago dismissed that. So I don't have time for this. But he doesn't say that. He receives right. us. Yeah. So if I'm, if, I'm hearing, if I'm hearing you right, you know, when that person... Uh, in, an individual that's in a bad way right now. Um, mm-hmm. The difference between is the the one person. Um, say you got two people with cancer. Uh, they're both lost. The one person comes before God and he says, "God, I'm broken. I'm hurt. I'm I'm just at the bottom. I don't know what to do. Please help me." Okay, mm-hmm. so. We could take that more or less as, you know, crying out, uh, you know, save me. Where the other person yeah. might fall down and say, heal me. 
if you heal me or, or even the ones that make a deal. If you heal me, uh-huh. Lord, I'll be in church every Sunday. Or if you hear me yeah. or heal yeah. me, I will yeah. pray. So, so if I'm hearing you right, yeah. that's the difference between that's the, the two. That's the difference, right. That is yeah, really yeah that, that's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. It, it, you know, God doesn't make any, <laughs> he doesn't make any deals. <laughs> he has mercy, oh. though. You know, when somebody comes in, the only thing they can really offer is their own terrible situation and their own sin that has wrecked their lives, that only God can heal them of that. They realize that that's when the Lord begins to work in in amazing ways. And sometimes it's slow progress, but it's it's progress. (laughs) So actually, God will make one deal with you. If you call upon the name of my son, yes, you will be saved. You will be saved. Well, I'll make that. Black and I'll make that yeah, pact true. with you. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Well, and, you know, and, and coming and trusting. So, Lord, you know how. To, you know my heart. Amen. And Amen. I need you as my savior. You know, there's right. no particular. Words, we're not told exactly what words to pray or how to say it. We have some, of course, guidance in Scripture. But mainly, it's the Lord to uh, those who call upon him. And just uh, That's right. uh, run to him for refuge. You know, I, I could have actually continued to talk excessively on into the evening. My my children have told me sometimes, you know, Dad, you can just talk incessantly. We kind of like what you say, but you just could talk all night. <laughs> well, you know that qualifies you to be a truck driver. You know that, right? You've already well, got how's that? qualifications of being a truck driver. <laughs> oh, well, I, I maybe I could uh, make those qualifications. Uh, meet that those qualifications in that realm but i i see you guys uh of course every time i travel i i travel a lot regionally and uh one thing i do i let truckers in and i i flash the lights when they know they can change lanes and i keep a good distance back i'm i'm pretty observant for things i know when to break and when to let people in and that sort of thing kind of go along uh, I, I like driving getting out on the highway and I like treating people courteously and I've seen that a lot from truckers truckers as a whole are a lot more courteous than your standard fair motorist <laughs> so, and I, you know talk about a truck weighing 80,000 pounds or something out there and still not as dangerous as an uh, impatient person driving a a uh, Toyota Prius out there, you know, uh, sometimes uh, people darting in and out of traffic can create terrible hazards or indecisive drivers. Road rage is the worst, you know. It's a good thing truckers don't have a lot of road rage. They could just mow down everybody. Just but you know right on going. Yes, sir. We have that, uh, you know, that, that's something that we see all the time. What's the hurry? You know, so right. it's like a lot of truckers just cruising along, just doing their job, and little mice in and out of their uh, their little uh, places where they're going so fast and furiously. <laughs> yep, yep. Well, brother, I appreciate you uh, coming on. I appreciate you sharing with us. And, you know, as your well, thank you. It's been my pleasure. That you, amen. And as your kids have told you that you can just talk and talk and talk, uh, we'll definitely have you back to do some more of that. Well, and if you have people contacting you about getting some uh, Christian literature, yep. uh, you know how to get a hold of me, and, and uh, we can put that. You can send me an email, and I'll do everything I can do to get this out to people individually. Okay. But also, I'll I'll send you a, a some of those a uh, couple of cases of those books, and it's all Amen. free of well, charge, no strings attached. Amen. Amen. Well, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Well, let me have a word of prayer with you before we close out. Thank you, 
Father God, we just thank you, Lord, that we do have the opportunity to come before you. Father God, as we had said before, we know that you only hear the voice of those you know. And, and Father God, we rejoice in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, knowing that you hear our voice. And the only reason you do is because we have bowed down and confessed Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We do believe that you have raised him from the dead. And, Father God, because of that, because of what the sacrifice he made, we can be called children of the living God. And we know from that point on you always hear our voice and you're always with us. I praise you for that, Lord. Yeah. Thank you, Father God, for this evening, Father, that our brother has come and, and spent time with us. And, Lord, we know that your word says that uh, iron sharpens iron. And as our brother has spoke to us tonight, Lord, I know that it's an encouragement. I know it's an encouragement to me. And, and Father God, and I'm, I'm quite sure it's it's been an encouragement for those others that have come and listened. And, Father God, I just pray your hedge protection around my brother. As he says, he does a lot of traveling and regionally, Lord. I pray, Father God, that your angel encampeth around about him. Father God, no hurt or harm or evil wicked thing will come upon him while traveling up and down these highways. And, Father God, sometimes, you know, I'm even, uh, you know, we all get into a little bit of a hurry from time to time. And, Father, I pray that uh, possibly through our carelessness, Lord God, that we would not bring any hurt or harm to anyone, that if we're going to change anybody's life, it's going to be by sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, Father God, I just thank you for my brother. I pray again, Lord, your hedge of protection around him and his family, Lord, his children, his grandchildren. I pray, Father God, if there is any sick or afflicted, Father God, that you would touch and heal them, Lord God. We know that you are Jehovah Rapha. You are the great physician, the great healer, and we praise you for that. Father God, I pray that you continue to open doors up to my brother. And, and Father God, as he travels through those doors, Lord, that there will be souls saved through him sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, Father God, for all those that are listening tonight and have come to uh, share in this time with us, I pray, Lord, if there is any of them that are uncertain, Father God, that aren't quite sure of uh, their salvation, not quite sure that if they were to perish tonight, what would they hear when they stand before you? Father God, I pray that if they have any questions, Lord, or or if by listening to this uh, service tonight that they have given their lives to Jesus Christ, we'd sure like to hear about that. We'd like to be able to share the joy of that as well as uh, pray with them. And, and Father God, I pray in the name of Jesus that they will reach out to us. So, Father God, as we go through this night, we give you all praise, we give you all glory, and we give you all honor. And I pray these things in the blessed and the holy name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. For those of you that have called in through the, you know, the Spreaker or iHeartRadio or whatever, uh, you know, whichever way you were able to get in uh, to this service tonight, if you have made a commitment to Jesus Christ or you're, you're wanting more answers about that, you're not quite sure, uh, you know, whether you'll go to heaven or not. If somebody asked you, Right now, if you died, if you would go to heaven, if you have any kind of hesitation or you stutter about it or you're just confused about it, you need to seek out uh, someone uh, to get the to get the right answer. To get the right answer, you know the word of God says that His children perish due to lack of wisdom. Don't perish due to lack of wisdom. If you have any questions, feel free to call this number, and I'll. I'll give it to you slow and twice so that you can write it down. But this number is 440-201-9826. That's 440-201-9826. That is a recorded line that is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You make a call into that within minutes there will be a notification that goes to my phone, and I will call you right back. And, again, that's a 24-7 number. Utilize it. So with that being said, uh, we give God all the praise and glory through this evening, through this time of fellowship, and I look forward to uh, being back with each and every one of you again. So I bid you all a good night, and I hope that we will talk later. Brother Sam, I thank you, and I will be getting in touch with you. Thank you, and it's been good to be with all of you. God bless you, and wherever you are and wherever you're going. And remember, uh, as uh, Jesus said, come to me. He gives an invitation. I'll give you rest.
he said. God bless all of you. God bless. Good night, brother. Good night.